Oh, we have all five. We have all five members of our board here tonight. Two, three here in the office, and two remote via Zoom. Sarah's back. The meeting recording is on, right, Sarah? Yes. There was a nod. That was a nod. Yes. Okay. Very good. Awesome. Thank you. I'm monitoring too many different screens, so I may need vocal confirmation. So I'm going to call the meeting. I'm going to open the meeting uh, at 5.01 p.m. Uh, I'm going to propose that we move that ANR application to the top of our agenda. I think it'll be quick and it might slightly delay the start of our public hearing, but I think that should be fine. Do you concur, Judy? Sure. Okay. All right. We have uh, the Morosky's Mar here. Uh, we have their application. They paid their ANR fee. Thank you very much. Uh, we have their plans. So let me share electronically their their in our plan right I think everybody should be able to see that if you guys here want to look at it physically there it is oh, okay um so laid out neatly um perhaps Cynthia you'd like to just tell us a little bit about what what's going on here and what your what you'd like to do I think Michael will What's up? tell what, what you want to do, what your plan is. Um, my plan is to sell the less than four acres parcel. Did they just freeze? I see we're still around and they're completely frozen. <laughs> oh, oh, we, we just lost you briefly. You said you wanted to, can we still hear you? Can you still? Yeah, can you hear? Yeah, so, he, so we want to sell lot one. The well, four, the less than, one. it's unstable. I'm not sure why. Um, To sell that lot and yeah. then keep the other lot out for back for, for ourselves, for our son. Okay, all right. And right now, uh, the, so really what you're, what the, a, the effect of the ANR is to create lot one out of the existing much larger parcel. Correct. Okay, very good. Um, I believe I did ask you this question so that your the the idea is that there is going to be this strip of land between this newly created lot one and the abutter to the <laughs> south. All yeah. right. Uh, do you know offhand the width of that strip? Do you know the width of the strip? He's hard of hearing. Um, that's why I'm repeating. I believe it's like 50 feet. And I think that the reason I, so I believe we can endorse this irrespective of whether what you end up creating with your back lot is buildable or not, we don't, you know, by endorsing an ANR, the planning board doesn't assert that the resulting parcels are buildable, right? Just to be clear. And what's not under the planning board's control are the highway department regulations per pertaining to driveways. And the reason I bring this up because it came up recently is the way the town of Waitley highway regulations require that driveways well, that driveways be set back at least 20 feet from all lot lines all right correct so whatever this width is you have to welcome you have to carve off 20 feet on either side so and then you need enough width left to build a driveway that will pass muster with the highway department. Right. And mm -hmm. what's, do you know offhand, what's the minimum requirement of width? Chris, there's width of the actual driveway plus- Driveway's a pretty standard one. 
10, 12 feet wide. And 12 feet. So if it's yeah. about, how, how wide did you say it was, Mike? You're thinking, what are you looking for? You're thinking it's. Can you see that number number? <laughs> but I understand that by carving up lot one and leaving this extra little bit, if you can see my mouse moving, Cindy. Yep. Obviously, your intention is to create the leave the right amount of frontage. Correct. With the idea that you know you're you're dealing you you've met frontage, you've met minimum lot size, and all of that. But if you cannot. If you're not legally allowed to build a driveway down this strip that course that complies with the town of Waitley's highway right, uh, driveway regulations, then you will effectively have a non-buildable lot because you won't be able to create access from the right of way. So that's why I'm asking. We don't, we can, I think we can just endorse this regardless of the answer. But you could be left with something that is not what you want. Yeah, their end use is relevant to us for there. Yes, your end use, well put, is you can carve up your land in any kind of crazy way you want, up to the limits of what's allowed under the bylaws for ANRs. But I was just looking at that strip, since the actual width of it is not marked on your plan, and I was just concerned we have that you might have something that's too narrow. No, it's at the other house. I I actually don't know and have to scale it. I asked Randy to make sure it was big enough. Well, we can just endorse it and sign the mylar, and they yeah. can confirm it with Randy. And if they need to do something, I JD knows about applying for waivers. I think it is possible they to get waivers. Yeah, from the select okay. board. Um, Randy can always make it wider, as long as we have enough frontage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, so we can endorse it um, before they pay the registry fee and get it registered. They should they should check this out, and if they need to come back, we can endorse another one. Right. Yep. Right. Is that clear? So you understand what we're what we're dealing with here? Uh, yeah. All right. So so balls in your cart to to check the driveway regulations and, and explore what your options are. Just talk okay. to Keith. You know, Keith Bird will we'll, we'll be able to explain it for you. But you'll yeah. definitely need to know accurately what that width is on your plan. Right. Okay? Yeah. Yep. So my I, own Yeah, I've read a plan I'd scale it and I know what, what it is. Okay. So my own inspection of the plan and a review of the a and R requirements and the bylaws. I see Sarah, Sarah, you're gonna let Brett into the into the meeting. Um, but it looks to me like this yes. otherwise meets all of the requirements for us to endorse it under as a approval not required. Is any questions or comments about no. that? Judy, you good? Yep. Sarah, you good? I'm good. Okay. Then um, I sh would like to hear a motion to approve this plan uh, for endorsement under ANR as an ANR. So, I so make a motion to approve this plan under as a for an ANR. Okay, so I'll give the I'll give the motion to JD on that one. I'll second and, it. Okay, I heard Sarah. I heard Sarah wins the second. Right. <laughs> okay, no. motion to be made second. We're going to do the roll call vote. Um, it is yes, yes, Laura. uh, Sarah, yes, Judy, oh. yes, and Brand is yes. So it's approved, endorsed unanimously. Sign this off. Um, so your mission here, guys, is done. We'll get back to you when everything's signed and ready for you to pick up at town offices. Mm -hmm. And if you need to come back to us for a new ANR with a new adjusted plan, you let us know. Um, just another 50 bucks. <laughs> oh, excuse me, JD. Aside from them, but just this particular case. Yes. This is AR1 or AR2. Uh, well, the AR1-AR2 boundary is not marked on this plan. However, 
that well, he was going. You might want to hang. You might want to hang for what's coming up next. Yeah. yeah because see. you may be affected. Well, you're you are probably <clears throat> not going to be affected because their okay. remainder <laughs> lot is so large. Okay. They won't be affected by the, uh, the minimum lot size issue. If they don't have the they yeah they would benefit from the amendment. So if you guys probably do want to hang for this <laughs> for what's about to come next, even if you just have something better to do. <laughs> what would be better than that? Okay. Well, they thought they were going to be after the hearing anyway. So yeah, that's right. Okay, so we're done with A and R, and so I'm going to. Uh, get ready to take this plan off the screen. Stop my share. Okay, so the next item on our agenda. Oh, we can't do this yet. You can't start the. I thought we would take at least fifteen minutes. We, we could talk about the hearing for five fifteen. It's only five twelve. We could talk about the awards. <laughs> oh yes, the awards. Um, Wait, what are we talking about? Which words are we talking about? How to distribute the beautifully framed ones that you oh, have. I was thinking, why don't we instead <laughs> just slip in the um, the uh, approve revised codification amendments to the subdivision regulations? Because that should be fast. Yep. Okay. That's so easy. All right. Let me... Um, Bring that. Wonder if they can hear us. Let me bring that. Who is that? Oh, I was supposed to be muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Well, we heard you. So, in case you're curious. All right. So, this is something not very relevant to any of you. But uh, what I'm sharing on my screen, so from the town clerk to remind everyone, we received um, some proposed town clerk proposed. Um, edits, changes in wording to uh, material in our subdivision regulations. Uh, at our last meeting, we were some confused about some of the references that seemed to be wrong. Laura did us a great service by going through the existing subdivision regulations with a fine tooth comb, identifying the differences, circulating all of that. And so um, what we have here is a marked up document that I'm going to now just basically turn into simple markup so we can just see the final versions of this, right, where the red lines in the left column indicate where changes were made. So, and I've confirmed all of these corrections. So this, so these sections referred to do indeed contain, for example, for the first one, those two sections, 234, 5E6, blah, 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 they do in fact contain the strip of text, superintendent of streets. So we're approving that that be changed to highway superintendent and so forth. Uh, we had a discussion there. What Michael, Mike Busa is going to be admitted, right? Sarah is monitoring monitoring that, right? Um, the one yes. thing that we decided not to do, there was a proposed change in one of the sections where you found the correct, the correct section, and it can, there's one use of the term building commissioner in the subdivision regulations. The town clerk had proposed that that be changed to building inspector we had our discussion and concluded, no, 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 it really should be the building commissioner. So one who has the right training and has as the best authorization to do what's involved for that. And actually spoke with Jim about that. And he agreed. Yep. And he's a building commissioner. Building commissioner. All right. So we deleted that proposed um, change sent to us by the town clerk in terms of what we're going to approve. All right. Any questions? So, so first of all, any questions about this? We will have to vote. 
Is there are there any questions from any member of the public who find this <laughs> quite as interesting? Come on, Harlan. I know. Right. Welcome to our world. Okay. So if there are right, Judy, you're quiet, Sarah, you're quiet. All right. So then I think all we need to do, and somebody needs to move to approve. What, what would the motion be here? I will move, move to approve the amendments. And thank you so much, Laura. Approve to move. Well, I think you want to say to approve the codification. Codification corrections. I second that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, as so we, we have a motion as to as approve the codification um, amendments. That's, that was the, just, did I get that right? Approve the codification amendments. As, as, amended. as amended by this, by the planning board. Okay, and that was, and Judy seconded, Sarah made the motion, Judy seconded it. So we'll do our usual roll call vote. JD. JD, JD seconded. I seconded. You seconded. Yes. Okay. So JD, you're voting yes. Laura? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Judy? Yes. Grant is yes. Okay. Motion. Well, observation, Grant. Yes. All right. I we think will... that, Grant, I think yes. the number of corrections that had to be made indicate that. Amy is using the wrong version of the subdivision regs. Probably. So I will make sure she's the the you use the version that's posted on yes. the website. Yes. So where she, she got used, she probably used the ones that were in the previous general bylaws. That's on her desktop. That's not yeah accurate. All right. I will um diplomatically point that out and make sure she's using the right version. So applying these corrections to the, to the proper version. All right, I think we're ready to close this agenda item. And now it being 518, go to the, you know, the main event. So it's 518, I'm going to open a public hearing for proposed zoning changes to clarify dimensional requirements for lots in agricultural res residential district two with frontage in agricultural residential district one. We see Mary's coming in. Got it. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to exert some executive authority here and I wanna share a set of charts that I've put together on this issue that I think not only explain and clarify the proposed amendments that we've we advertised, we posted more than two weeks ago, and that are the subject of tonight's discussion. That though I but I believe I've also identified an area of concern and something that is not yet fully addressed by these amendments. And I think there are actually stakeholders potentially in this room and fully, at least we should have this discussion, right? So let me just try to whip you through these slides and take questions, interrupt me with questions as we go. So first little bit of background is we're dealing with situations where there's a lot that is divided in some way by the AR1 boundary. So in our zoning bylaws, AR1, agricultural residential one is defined as extending 400 feet back from the right of way on any existing road. okay? So that can effectively, as I've diagrammed here, split an, a lot as it's done into two portions, which you could think of as an AR1 portion and an AR2 portion, right? Now, when such splitting occurs, the it seems like the location of the use, like if you're putting a house in that lot, the location of the use within the lot determines whether the use is in AR1 or AR2. So I've depicted here an example of a split lot, I mean a conceptually split lot with a, a dwelling in AR1 and thus that's that's an example of a use in AR1. If you 
move that dwelling or that structure into the AR2 portion, you now have a use that is in AR2. Same lot, you just put the structure in a different location within a lot. That is interpreting the word use to, to assume where the house is located. Yes, and there's nothing in our bylaws that, that determines explains that defines this. the word use. That's right. However, I mean, I just wanted to no, clarify that. It's, it's that important. Be. There's a little footnote down there that says this is, I'm making this, this is really, in fact, this wording is more appropriate. This statement is really more of an assumption that it's based on what the building inspector has concluded looking at our bylaws. And it, there are also examples in our bylaws where our table of use regulations makes a distinction between uses in AR1 and AR2. With certain, certain uses, if they're in AR1, are permitted, but they're not permitted in AR2 or vice versa. So there's precedent for this interpretation in our bylaws, but there's no specific language that explains how you would make this decision which arguably in and of itself is a problem. However, I've looked at some surrounding other town bylaws and I've not yet found any language that speaks to discriminating or determining when some, when a use is in. It's only a problem only if use. someone has a problem. Right. It's not necessarily a problem. Right. So moving on, the way our bylaws work is that the location of the use in the lot will determine how our table of use regulations and our table of dimensional requirements will be applied to determine compliance with zoning. So where you place the structure relative to this boundary will bring different rules into scope. And that's where we get into some counterintuitive <laughs> um, effects. We have proposed to address this. And I haven't actually gone through some of the scenarios, but the, tonight's public hearing is about what I've depicted here, a proposed amendment to the table of use regulations. So this is what we posted. It's an amendment that takes the form of uh, two different new footnotes, one footnote with two asterisks and another footnote with three asterisks. So let's address the first footnote, and you'll see where um, it applies, it, it's used in the table. Let's take the example of the 80,000 square foot minimum lot area for, for uses in AR2 on lots served by public water. So the, the effect of the this amendment is to say that where a um, when it comes to lot area, well, for the 80,000, it just says where, where a lot has frontage in AR1, the area within the AR1, within AR1 may count towards the minimum lot area. So just to, to back up, one of the things that was confusing is when you split a lot into these two portions, and now you're computing minimum lot area. Do, do the area in both portions count towards minimum lot area? That was not specified in the bylaws at all. They were silent on this, this issue. And so the, the, the two asterisks say that all they say is that whatever area in the lot is within AR1, Counts towards the minimum lot area. Okay, so basically the whole lot counts for minimum lot area. That wasn't the issue that affected um, or potentially affecting Kaylee and Red Bean. Their issue was a matter of frontage. When their use was put into beyond the four the four hundred foot area, put into the AR2 zone of their lot, that created a frontage issue. Because theirs is a lot without public water, 
And normally, if the use is in AR2, you require 300 feet of frontage. So here, there's a pair of these three asterisk footnotes usage, where it says where the lot frontage is in agricultural residential one, where the lot, whatever, again, to go back to this picture, if uh, on the left side of that lot, you imagine that's Weber Road or some road where the lot has frontage in AR1, then the minimum requirements of that zoning district will apply. So the way this amendment would work is that if you have a use in AR2 and you're a lot with public water, normally you'd require 200 feet of frontage. But with this proposed amendment, if approved, only 175 feet of frontage will be required. That's the effect of the footnote. Similarly, for lots without public water, like on Long Weber Road, instead of 300 feet of minimum frontage, this amendment would allow only 200 feet of frontage. Right? Do we understand what this, these two amendments do? So, there's this point that I want to make that location matters here. Placement of a structure within a lot relative to this boundary may still lead to counterintuitive non-compliance with zoning. What I'm going to show you, this will have to do not with frontage, but it's going to have to do with lot area. <clears throat> And it's only certain kinds of lots that are going to be affected by this. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you what will seem like a very theoretical or hypothetical where this could happen. But if you'll bear with me, I'm going to show you a case where I think either it could happen or we it almost happened. And it's with um uh brandy. And right. Yeah. Okay. So let me show you the here's just just so we know, here's a safe scenario. Scenario 1A, a lot of public water. Just imagine I've I've created a crafted a little example, right? Here's an 88,000 square foot lot, you know, 400 feet back from the road. It's a square, you know, rectangular lot. It everything's copacetic with this lot without any new amendments to the table of eventual requirements. This is fine. With the use, with the dwelling within 400 feet of the road. Now we move the dwelling beyond the 400 foot boundary. Now, under current zoning, or what we're doing, dealing with tonight. The 200 foot minimum frontage would not be satisfied. And just by moving the dwelling back there, you would basically say you can't do that. And build up, you have to put your house within 400 feet. Now, but with the proposed amendment, we now have adequate frontage. So we've so this is what our amendment is solving. And this was the scenario that in fact brought us to this. To even try to do this in the first place. But let's continue. Here's a here's a scenario, one C. Still a lot with public water. Here I've just changed the dimensions a little bit. Now it's a uh, it's an L-shaped 68-70k square foot lot. As you can see, we put the dwelling more than 400 feet back into the AR2 area of this particular lot. Now this would fail zoning on both conditions, even with the amendment. You amend it, you, now this meets minimum frontage with the amendment, but by placing the dwelling in that back part of the lot, now it fails the AR2 minimum lot area requirement of 80,000 square feet. Okay. So just by deciding for whatever reason, you're going to 
put your house further back from the road. <coughs> and you see that, that that's not allowed by by zoning. I want to continue. That was the scenario. The three examples with public water. Same thing happens in lots without public water. Here's a bigger area. This is all fine. You've got a hundred thousand square foot lot. You've put the dwelling close to the road. It's within the AR1 area. 60,000 square feet minimum lot is all you need. 200 foot minimum frontage is all you need. Move it back. Now you've got this problem. So here's the thing. So for Kaylee and I'm getting them all confused. Kaylee and Brett. Kaylee and Brett. Um, they have the necessary frontage. They moved their dwelling back into that AR2 area. Okay. And with the amendment, they have enough area. They have enough area. But I want to show you. So just remember yeah. one thing. Yep. And I don't mean to cut you short. Yeah. But there's an awful lot of bylaws in the town of Waitley and every other town in, in the Commonwealth. Right. You, we could be here for an awfully long time yeah. if we wanted to look at every scenario that could possibly really get it. Right. So, I mean, you're just creating random lots out of your head. Well, but let so, me show you which this. is which is fine. I appreciate what you're doing, but remember, every we could go back to anyone. So you're still seeing like what I'm sharing. Yeah. So this was an ANR that the um, that the planning board approved in 2022 for Brandy and uh, Brad. This particular parcel could have the problem that I just described. Okay. If they had, and I don't know exactly where they placed their building relative to that lot line, but you will notice it's the area of parcel A in this ANR so, is under 120,000 square feet. But you have to remember when that lot was when that lot was cut out, it was cut out with the current bylaws in mind. And that's why it was cut out like that. And that's why the house was located where, where it was. Brett and Kaylee's, on the other hand, became the confusion with, hey, if we're gonna put the driveway over here and do all that. Then it should be this road frontage. So, what I'm saying is, yeah, that lot could have had the problem. So could about 20 other ones in wait if the bylaws yeah. were what they were then versus what they are now and in the future. Well, what I've just described was true at the time of this ANR. It just nobody knew that it was there. On the NRA. Remember what they I said. decided they had to put their building in the back court of that lot, they could have been stopped at that. Remember what I said earlier? <laughs> Nothing's a problem until someone has a problem. Well, right. That's why we're but so go yeah, go ahead, Judy. Maybe we could clarify this a bit. I don't think there was any intention in creating these two changes, these two uh footnotes to make every split lot buildable, which is, I think, what Harlan is saying. We, what Correct. we did is try to clarify what the planning board had intended when it created AR2. And that was simply, if it was a split lot to, to use with frontage in AR1, to recognize that AR1 frontage counted, and also to count the parcel the part of the lot that was in AR1 towards minimums in AR2. Um, we definitely tried to make lots in AR2 bigger. So the fact that at, when we created AR2, so the fact that some lots may not meet the minimum dimensional requirements um, was actually deliberate. And that, that makes sense because I believe their purpose and intent was to make the lots bigger. But yeah, you know, it's like, to make the lots bigger so as to encourage clustered zoning. And yeah. if you clustered zoning, 
you could actually have bigger density than you could have in AR1 before we created AR2. So we corrected the two things that needed clarification. Um, there's, there's no intent to make every split lot buildable. So I, what, I, what I think I'm trying to do is point out that these scenarios can occur. We can decide. So I think what, what, what I feel has happened is that it, we didn't recognize this problem until Haley and Brett came along. And now we are making an effort to correct the frontage issue. I've identified, I think, cases where what maybe the, the, the question I really am trying to get at is, is this a desired, is this effectively a land use policy? Now that we know that by simply moving a structure within a lot relative to this boundary, there are some unknown number of situations where people will no will not be able to build. They may get an ANR. We may or may not remember to warn people. Like there's nothing in the bylaws that says when we just like we did with the Morawskis, we can say you can carve up your land any way you want. We're not in, and we don't endorse it as buildable. Um, but there's it's really not easy to find in the bylaws this particular situation and know that if you've carved up your land in a certain way and then you try to build a building and put your put your house. But a lot of what you're doing. I think if I think if you have a registered engineer, he should be able to point this out. But, but I mean, like a lot of what you're doing, Judy uses a word often that I like is intent, you know, and like you left out probably five, six or seven other examples that would have been contrary or supportive of this. And what if someone's house for wetland reasons, for uh, right away, what if their house isn't, what if the front of it's in AR1 and the back of it's in AR2? What if the septic design goes to AR2. Right. What if their porch comes out on AR1? Right. I mean, you could we could be here all day long right. looking at this. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say, I don't think you're ever gonna get anything to a cookie cutter match, but your adjustments meet what the intent originally was of the AR1 and AR2, I believe. I think if I could interject, please. Uh, what you proposed, in my opinion, is just creating greater flexibilities for people to have options to, put structures, homes, what have you, on these properties that may, for whatever reason, necessitate that buildings are in AR2, maybe topography, wetlands, what have you. Um, and in my opinion, if we're able to create some flexibility for people to be able to do that, I don't really see a problem with it. And I think that this is a minimal change, really. Um, and I think that it's going to, um, support our intention, which is to help people get to the place that they want to be if it's within our power to do so. So um, I know we're not looking for a motion yet, but I right. don't see any big problems with it. I concur. I, I would like to say, Brad, I appreciate you putting this up though, because it does explain to other people, who, anyone who might be watching. But I think what you were trying to get at is it, it would be nice to know this at the very start instead of after thousands of dollars yeah. spent on things right. um, to know where you actually yes. land, whether this possibly could work or right. no way. Well, and like, to I your point, you. especially for somebody who is maybe looking to move to town from maybe from the Boston area and they know nothing about Waitley and they're looking to buy a piece of raw land, they spend $185,000 on this piece of land that they find out six months later they can't put a house on and they live two hours away and now this is like worthless. <laughs> so right. I think if we can avoid those situations, why shouldn't we try to? I mean I'm I'm definitely prepared to drop this. There is a simple like I'm I'm supportive and I would personally vote for the existing amendment as it was just to direct the issue. Mm -hmm. I want to point out to everybody 
So I know that this raises other potential arguments. If, if you are at all concerned about wanting to fix both problems, meaning allow not only frontage, but allow give allow the flexibility for structures to be moved within a lot relative to this line. It is a relatively simple relaxation of the proposal, though Judy will not like it. <laughs> All right, and I'll just simply point out, I'll just go back to my, show you what, explain at least what that is. And now again, showing you the proposal, the amendment that is up before us tonight. So if you amended this as follows, imagine deleting the footnote that has the two asterisks, just deleting it. Okay. And just for the moment, just to make this simple, put three asterisks after the 80,000 and the 120,000. But this would say that amendment, this would be, this would actually be allowed tonight because it would be effectively making this proposal less restrictive rather than more. Mm -hmm. But if you shrank the lot size. What I would, what that amendment would say is that if there was a lot that had frontage in AR1, but the use was moved for whatever reason into the AR2 portion, that now, and we're to say we're dealing with a lot with public water, then instead of 80,000 square feet of minimum lot area, only 40,000 square feet of minimum lot area would be required. The existing footnote the two asterisk footnote only says that you can use area for both AR1 and AR2 combined when computing minimum lot. If you discarded that and it's basically said that if a lot has frontage in AR1, then the minimum lot size for AR1 applies to that lot. That, that almost defeats the purpose of AR2. That's been the argument, and I recognize it. I don't entirely understand. I think that's a total, I think that's a total change of the bio, of the proposal grant. I think that's beyond what we can do by by amendment in a public hearing. You'd have to, you'd have to re-advertise. Well, I mean, I think that claim needs to be adjudicated I mean, I don't I've heard this claim made that that kind of amendment here to the table of use Judy used the word eviscerate the open space cluster development bylaw which was the purpose for creating AR2 in the first place I can I've studied uh, that particular bylaw and it's I can't say, I don't know the answer to that. Brentford, um, I, land and error one error two tax differently? No, to, not to my knowledge. Okay. What I don't know, so I, I feel like the board has before, and I, I see that Mike Yusa has a question. So I'm gonna, we'll get to questions in a moment because I wanna finish this. Um, I feel like the board has some options before it. We can simply acknowledge that this situation exists where if you move your structure within a lot, put it beyond the AR1 boundary, then you need much bigger lot sizes. But frontage, AR1 frontage seems to be okay. We could say, we're good with that. We think there might be cases that come up where somebody may want to put their building, they have a, they have something in the AR1 portion, and they need to build their, put their dwelling up in the AR2 
two portions, but they don't have a lot area. Please tell me it's going to turn off your mic. Then the planning board would have to be in the situation of saying, we know that that could have happened, but for the, for whatever reason, you're not allowed to do that. I, I think I think you're really confusing this here. You keep talking about moving the house from here to there. Yeah. I think typically when people buy lots, yeah. or in, in the case of the beans here, when when they cut out lots, they do that with the idea in their head where they want their house. Yes. And so the lot that they are looking for and to cut out and of their main property or to purchase. If they know where they want their house, they already know with the you know with this what they need for boundaries and whatnot. Right. And I think that's kind of important to consider here because when if you shrink, to me this is a more thing about lot size, not frontage. The frontage seems out of whack to me if, if we we weren't even involved, just because like in our case with not putting another driveway in, and why should the frontage change whether your house is there or here? Right. To me, the AR2 really represents a larger lot size. And, you know, if you're gonna buy a lot, you're gonna make a lot, you know where you want your house. It's very easy. That's true, Kaylee and Brett, it, right? But if you, it was, it didn't, it didn't even come up until we pointed this out to you. It, 100% correct. And that's why we're here for these amended changes because the road front is But isn't like, that the counter argument? That this was a case where they knew, Kaylee and Brett knew where they wanted to build their house. In and they case, were ready to go ahead. In which case, 10 years from now, five years from now, or 100 years from now, when somebody wants to move their house, they're going to have that argument and they're going to have to come to the planning board at that point. And say, hey, this is this is what we're looking to do. I just as a this is as a town's person. This is not as someone who wants to, you know, their son to build a and daughter want to build a house. As a town's person, general public here, I would not want to see the lot the lot frontage for an AR2 shrink that significantly. I like the AR2. You mean the AR2. You, you like you would not like to see the lot size. That's right. You would you feel that the lot the front edge, lot and if the lot the fronts in AR1, that AR1 frontage ought to apply. But if the design of the, the layout of the land use means whatever you're going to do, the building is in the AR2 portion, you like the idea that the lots, I'd the be overall willing, lot sizes are much I'd be willing to bet when this, when, when this was constructed and Judy and, and others on the board, I'd be willing to bet that the frontage issue was probably ancillary or insignificant, or hey, let's you know just hold it out. They met for a problem or a perceived problem or a future development issue on lot size, not road frontage. Mm -hmm. And they corrected and established that with the AR1 and AR2. The road frontage, in my opinion, is 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 like you know insignificant. Insignificant. Yeah. You know, it, it was the lot size that was the issue. They corrected it. Yes, we're here well, to. We, we had actually assumed that we were dealing with developments in AR2 and that roads would be built and that the frontage roads. would be on those new roads. I mean, that's yeah. what we were talking about. Yeah. Somebody seemed to have marked up. Okay. Well, that's just my. What I, I feel like I've said my piece. All right. I wanted to put this out there, and then this is what we're doing. We're having this meeting for. So I want to. What I want to do next is to see if there are any other comments or questions from members of the board, and then I would like to, if if there are none, Sarah, Judy. Then what I'd like to do is Michael has a question. Yes, that I want to open it for questions from the <clears throat> questions and comment from the public. So I see that Mike Busa has raised his hand. So Mike, please, you've got the floor. Thanks. It seems like there's a lot more language in here than there really needs to be, in that it is total lot size could cover this, not denoting AR1 versus AR2 breakout in any way. And then a simple footnote that is the frontage requirement is based on the zone in which the frontage exists. Because it seems like that is the intent here, right? Because there are, there are roads in AR2. 
in town and and that but i think that clarification is, is that the where the frontage exists that is the minimum frontage required it, that seems to cut kind of cut to the chase and as i understand it that's what we're trying to get to here so i don't know are you proposing any changes in language so that what we can't really do is take a whole brand new approach here now so are you suggesting the change no, in i think i think that what i'm what i'm trying to get to is putting plain language for my understanding of what is written in the document which is and it seems like this is what we're trying to get to that if you have a lot that has both AR1 and AR2 coverage, but the frontage is an AR1, the AR1 frontage minimum applies. If you want to build in the AR2 area, the AR2 acreage or minimum lot size applies. I think that is, I just wanna make sure that I am understanding Clearly, because I've been going back and forth a little bit with Jim Hawkins on this, and that is what he thinks that is is the case. And so I just want to make sure that that is also what the board is clear on. I believe that that is, hold on a second, Judy. Uh, I believe that that is exactly what this amendment to the table of dimensional requirements accomplishes. It says that if a lot has frontage in AR1, then AR1 lot frontage rules apply depending on whether it's served by public order or not. And if it's in, um, and then, but acreage is applied based on whether the use is in AR1 or AR2. Perfect. So I think, I, I think, think you're both correct. Yeah, yeah. I think what Michael's saying is a great point. Yeah. It could have been done with verbiage and language. We did it. You did it differently here, yeah. but it accomplishes that same thing. Yeah, like that. But as long as it's accomplished, don't change the language and have to open it back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, your your understanding is correct, and we believe that this language achieves that effect. Um, I can't always see. Are there is any other comments or questions from any members of the public? Brant. Yes. Um, unless you have side lot access, the frontage is always going to be an AR1, correct? No, I think the intent is if you build it, if you are starting in, a, if you're building a road in AR2, when you lay it out, you need the acreage that's in AR2. After that, it may become AR1, but it's not, it's not initially. Okay, so if you're putting in another, if you're putting in a new yeah. road, yeah, then okay. it could be. Okay. So this is the zoning map and the green areas in the gate. So there are, and I don't unfortunately know enough about some of these other roads, but clearly AR1 extends not along every every road in Waco, but I guess these are, there's some, yeah, the intent was for if you put in a new road, well, yeah, yeah so, right. So I've always understood it to be every town, every public way, if a, if a lot has frontage on a public way, then it's in, it, its frontage is an AR1. Right, and 400 feet back from the road right. would be the AR1. That's right. Yeah. And so for these yeah. roads that go off, mm -hmm. that lead away, say, from Haydenville Road or what whatnot, those, whatever those, whatever the status of those roads are, they're not, yeah, say, the one, ways. The one, and the reason it's defined in terms of lot frontage is because of the I-91 you need to have access from the road. So so AR1 does not extend either side of I-91. Okay. Okay. So that's the zone. Okay. Okay. Then um stop sharing. Motion. Yeah, so well, not yet. 
I think. I think the next thing I do is I close the public hearing. Closing the public hearing at 5.56 p.m. Okay, so this is where, so do we have anything else that we want to discuss about this? I, I, I'll say so continue to have reservations about this situation, but I certainly support the amendment. If everyone's comfortable with it, then I support the amendment as drafted. I make a motion to amend the zoning bylaws to clarify the frontage and minimum area requirements of lots in Agricultural Residential District 2 with frontage and Agricultural Residential District 1. Motion's been made. Judy, Judy gets the second on that one. Who, who, who was it that just made that motion? I can't see. Judy. Thank you. Made the Thank you. And Judy seconded the motion. Okay. So we'll do our usual roll call vote. Yes. Judy? Yes. Laura? Is yes. Judy? Yes. Sarah? Yes. She yes. Okay, she, okay, yes, and Brant is yes. All right, so the motion passes unanimously. That has to go to town meeting now, right? Uh, yeah, we'll talk about the... Um, We'll talk about what we have to do next with all of the bylaw revisions that we've approved to get them over to the select board for for further consideration. Okay. All right. That's off. That item is off of our agenda. We're ready to move on to the next item. Right. You guys didn't bring Bob this time. So. We did not. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think what I want to do next is um, so we've done the codification, we've done that. Oh, cool. So let's do the amendments to common driveway and side lot access special permit application. We saw do a screen share. You other guys don't really want to sit through this, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, where was I? Good. So here's the. Okay, very good. All right. So what I'm, what I've done, I want to for for discussion. This was the first, uh, the Kaylee and Brett Bean special permits mm -hmm. were the first time in a long time we've done this. And it was just not a smooth process. And there's just a lot of things that were unclear. And in particular, I would say the cost associated with advertising was significant mm -hmm. on the order of nearly, I think it was nearly at that nearly $900, all right? Now, when we do when we do public hearings for site plans, we have it in the application sheet, in the application. There's language that says that the applicants shall pay the cost of advertising. Such language was not present in the application for a driveway special permit. Okay. And so, and the other thing was that the application is filled in by the applicant and then delivered to the town clerk, who often should stamp it, but there was no actual place on the form for the applicant to write a date. Okay. And that just, it, particularly for things involving public hearings, we need good tradability about mm -hmm. when all kinds of different things took place. So I took the original form and just revised it a little bit so that, and I've highlighted and that there's a, now a place where you can write in or type in a date. I've made no other changes. These, I have to say, in a world where mostly we, we do our forms electronically, the forms themselves seem to be formatted with the expectation that people are going to handwrite on them. 
I'm not wild about that, but I didn't adjust that. I've left all these underlines mm -hmm. and things for people to fill it in. But I, I believe I've got all the right, all the content needed. I maybe reorganized just how it's formatted on the page for clarity. Okay. Um, but there's a place to put in whether you want side lot driveway access or common driveway, and and for whatever your reasons are for that, you have different ways of indicating what the premises are. There is a street address, like in Brett and Kaylee's case, they didn't have a street address, but they had a zone, or they definitely had a map and parcel mm -hmm. number. Right? There's an owner, half con signature, mailing address, phone, all of that. Then in the instructions. Oh, there the other thing that was confusing to some was this whole thing about the highway, the driveway regulations. So there is original language that just says familiarize yourself with the zoning bylaw, mm -hmm. and there's that part of it's attached. But I've added or I'm proposing to add language that just says also familiarize yourself with the town of Waitley Highway Department regulations for driveways. Just say they're posted, they can be obtained from the highway department, and that extra sentence just to say we cannot approve a driveway special permit for any driveway unless it conforms to the highway department regulations. I mean, that's the truth is we can't approve it if the highway department doesn't approve it, mm -hmm. but they won't approve it if. Doesn't right, it doesn't happen. However, but the Board of Selectmen can issue a variance for that. That's a good point. There you go. So perhaps so you're the ruling body on that. You appeal to the selectmen, you make your case, and they can decide on what they want to do. Could we just add in then that we cannot approve it without without highway department approval? Well, without highway department approval or special special permit from the select board, you said? Or a select board variant. Select board variant. So let's try this language. Actually, what uh, the case that I had, Keith Bridal denied it. The selectman issued the variance, then he issued me a permit. So, but so when I got the issue, the permit from Keith Bridal is approved because the selectman authorized him to approve the permit. Okay. So, so where does that? So if so, how would that affect our process? Like, does that mean we could approve a special permit for a common driveway? Um, Even and, if it doesn't conform to the standard. Yeah, rules. but I guess the highway department would, they would still have to send this approval because that's part of the Bible. Yeah, they have to sign up. But, but the highway department, if it doesn't meet the requirements, he denies it and has to go for right. what it would be more like. Right. I think what, what JD, if JD is saying is mm -hmm. that. Um, what we need is the special permit from the highway department, period. We just need permission without approval. 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 But, yeah. It complies, or if it doesn't, you seek a variance or relief from the board of the highway department approval. Usually. So maybe that language is simpler, right? Mm -hmm. That the planning board cannot approve. And there are a lot of other yeah, things. That's very, yeah, that's a safe way to put it. Because they, the highway superintendent can issue the permit if the board of selectmen is offered relief. So if, if we had a situation where we had a, an application for a special permit, the highway department said, we don't approve. Well, I guess, do we deny the special permit while they go seek a variance? Because we have to take action. I think we can continue if the if the applicant says we can continue. The applicant has to request it. Okay. So, but this seems like the right language in the instructions. I think it seems very clear. Um, Decisions are quick. It says in the regulations for I'm reading the, the highway department rules that they have to make a decision in 20 days of the hearing, 21 days of the hearing, so they get the answers quickly. 
in my case, they made a decision that night. All right, so I think we're good with this first yellow highlighted yeah. section because that addresses this that issue. Because of the way the original, go ahead, Judy. The second, the second yellow paragraph about the fees, you took took that straight from the site plan review application, right? This, the items one through five were in the original um, special permit application form for the planning board. Yeah, I know that where it starts, the full cost of advertising. Oh, yes, yes. So I, I haven't quite got there yet. I oh, just okay. point out, I, I just, in this, this next section, with the application, the application must also, I just added must also submit mm -hmm. because they have to, in the previous sentence, they have to submit an application with a fee. And then I said, well, they also have to submit these other things. So I just clarified that language. But what they have to submit with the application and the fee is not, I haven't modified that. That's okay. from the original special permit application <laughs> form. And this language, highlighted in yellow is what I've copied from the site plan review application. I'm assuming we can, of course, only by vote, make these kinds of changes and, and say that by putting this language in the instructions, we thereby are authorized to bill applicants for these special permits for advertising costs. Is that That's true? We did it for, That's the way we did it for the site plan review. In fact, we were requested to do that by the town administrator. Okay. So there's no other place in Waitley's legal, you know, rules and regs where these these things are set. We can do this right here in the instruction. Yeah, we, when we're, we're making a proposal to the finance committee about the budget for the planning board, you don't know what's going to come in front of you for right. applications. Right. From the, right. So yeah. anyone other than the applicant to bear the responsibility of the advertising costs, right? This is silly. They yeah. Need to cover that. Yeah, I think it's entirely justified, yeah. especially given how expensive it is. And the two, the advertising for the most recent special permits, again, we haven't done this since 2010, so it doesn't happen a lot, but still it was essentially an, an unanticipated $900 hit on the planning right. board's budget. Yeah. And it seems entirely justified that Absolutely. applicants for such permits should be able to pay those costs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Brian? Those are the. Did I just Brent, yes. Along those lines, was the original intent of the hundred and fifty dollars per each of these to cover the advertising okay. fees? Why would me or no? Oh, we can go now. Oh. You know, it's a. It's funny you should ask that question, Sarah, because I recently asked. Um, I haven't asked. Oh, was lost. I'm sorry. Who's who else is speaking? Can you mute? Um. I ask where the fee monies go, because they don't flow into the planning board. Like we don't get income. Like we don't make money from- the, So we are not a revolving fund. We're not right. a revolving fund. Okay. It just goes into the general, like, so site plan <clears throat> fees go into the town coffers. Now- I, I mean, I can understand that they offset our costs, like our clerical services. Right. Yeah, I think, but I they think are the, double what our other fees are. And with this one, sometimes you need to double it up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like, I looked at ZBA and their fees are, they're a little bit higher. I mean, they do, but it seems like the fees are not about, well, I, I don't know entirely what the fees are expected. There are to... there are other issues with with public hearings. There's the clerical time to send out the letters. There's the postage. There's the time involved in preparing the legal ads and getting them set. So, I as long as this is offsetting our expenses to the town, I get that. But if the original intent with this was that that 150 would cover 
the advertising fees. And now we're saying the advertising fees on top of that, it's redundant. But if it's covering our existing costs of the time it takes, I understand that. I just want to make sure we weren't double dipping. Yeah, we're it. definitely not double dipping at all. Okay. The, the I think the main the main costs associated with public hearings are the clerical work, printing you know, printing the butter notices, mailing them. So here full cost of advertising all legal notices and mailings is it's a lot to the applicant. Yeah. yeah. Um we're all volunteers. It's yeah. Like our secretaries and someone yeah. else will see those costs. But there are some additional clerical costs. Yeah. Just managing this whole process and um, filing and distribution. So yeah, we're volunteers. So um, I just wanted to make sure we wouldn't need that needed to be reevaluated. Yeah. So. No, I think once upon a time it might have covered everything, but it's it's been a long time. Right. Yeah. Okay. So those are my only proposed changes. And so, go ahead, Judy. If you go back to the um, where you have the address of the applicant and you made verbally the point that sometimes it's only a parcel number, perhaps we should say street address or parcel number. Oh, like up here, street address, or is that what you're thinking, Judy? Well, is this what you're thinking? Except that yeah. Either. Yeah. Can I interject? Yeah, go ahead. I kind of like um, asking for both the street address and the map and oh, parcel number. I'm sorry, I didn't see the map. I didn't see that down below. I, I withdraw my point. No yeah. Okay. yeah, I think there. I think there's scenarios in which both of these things. I think it's it's not going to hurt to have more right. of that information to make sure we're talking about the correct property. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is there any issues with if the applicant is not the owner? The owner authorizes the applicant to do this. Hmm. Well. I know when I did my crunch in Egypt Road, I didn't own the property yet. There's on the property. But I was seeking permission to do everything before I closed on the property. So shouldn't we ask that the owner of the property authorize this and the applicant sign it? So two signatures. Oh, I see. So not only signature of applicant, but the signature, signature of owner. Yeah. I don't know. Do you need I think it might be a Question for town council. I don't know if you need standing to do this. In case where someone's applying for something, the owner mm -hmm. is, yeah. doesn't know. I think. Oh, we're, we'd be required to notify the owner. Okay. Thank well, it's, you. It's, it's a matter of standing. One at a time, Mary. The, the owner gets a copy of the legal notice, the same as the abutters do. It doesn't matter whether they live here or out of state. As part of the application for building permits, we always have to have the owner's signature and the applicant's signature. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's a question of standing, whether the applicant has the authority. And for a building permit or for an ANR, you would definitely need the owner to sign because you're actually doing something to the property. Um, I don't know whether that's the case for for these kinds of applications, it, it might be a good question for for a town council. I, I, I know as this goes through the process to develop this thing, they're going to have to have when they apply for building permits, they're going to have to have signatures from the owner and from the applicant. So let yeah. me let me the just same, ask the same with question. an ANR. The same with an ANR. Okay. Um, I just want to see for, for what we just did. Sorry, give me one second. Because 
part of the way I'd like to answer this is that if the existing form before we make this change, didn't make this distinction. I don't know why we need to introduce a new distinction. That's why I think it's a question for town council, whether you actually need to have stand. The owner has standing, the applicant doesn't if they're not the owner, but I don't know whether you need standing for this. I mean, I do think JD has a point that if somebody's say, somebody's renting the property and they have effective control of the property and the owner lives out of state now or it's a trust or something like that and they've come in with this application and we aren't necessarily aware of whatever the, the lease agreement is or we're not privy to that information I could see it being an issue and also like yes we're going to send a legal yeah. notice but are they going to look at it yeah I'm just looking at like the, the 2010 application for a special permit that would, as far as I know, the last one the board handled, and it just had the signature of the applicant. It happens that the owner, I mean, the owner's identified and the applicant. I mean, I've just mirrored this design. Right. Correct, it's just it's when the owner is not the applicant. Right. Yeah. Like perhaps the beans, maybe Colin Solomon's that yeah. property and the son is trying to develop it. I would assume that it's not required for this because they won't get a building permit. Yeah. But and then I guess the other be because I'd like to. I mean, I don't. This on the one hand, I don't feel a sense of urgency here. I don't think that we're we're going to have many more special permits pending our doors. So we have time to get this form right. On the other hand, I always like to just get <laughs> done. We could we could investigate this further. But one thing, how are we doing on time? I would just look to see how the ZBA application form looks. And I think if the ZBA application form doesn't have separate signatures for owners and applicants. I kind of feel like it's good enough for them sure. or good enough for us. And I'm yes, not sure. I don't, think, I don't think you can make that assumption, Grant. There are two different legal processes. They're, but they're both under the Zoning Act, the same provision of the Zoning Act for special permits. And it doesn't speak to, I mean, I looked high and low through the Zoning Act for guidance on forms, and there just isn't any. And so I don't think that there's a Zoning Act provision for special permits issued by zoning boards versus special permits issued by planning boards. There's just provisions for special permits. Maybe it would be best practices to just ask town council and get their official whatever decision. If that's the consensus, I'm happy to <laughs> Happy that maybe we should just ask that question. All right. So maybe in the interest of not beating every horse that comes before us <laughs> to death, um, why not? I simply we don't have to vote on this. Why well, what we could do, we could do is vote it provisionally based on town council's opinion, and if town council says you're fine, then we're all set. I like that. I like that. So, Judy, do you want to make that motion? I move that we accept the changes that Brand has made to to the special permit application. Pro provisional. Oh, conditional on town councils indicating that the owner's signature is not required. Okay. Motion has been made. I'll I second think I that. See Sarah waved, so the motion's been made by Judy and seconded by Sarah. We'll do our roll call vote starting with JD. Yes. Yes. Laura? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Judy? Yes. Grant is yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. I'm not sharing my screen anymore, right? Uh, okay. Okay, so now the next item on our agenda is approval of minutes. And we have a slew to approve to get us caught up. So let me 
Yes, give me a second to just get us ready for that. We're, we're all good through 2023. So the first set of minutes we're going to approve. Share my screen again. Down. Now, um, so I'm sharing minutes of our meeting in January 3rd. Oh, shoot. There was a, on my screen I saw, did Mike Fusta still have his hand up? Was there still a question? He had Mike brought Fusa? his hand down. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So I sent out original minutes for January 3rd. Judy revised them. I accepted all of her changes and sent out a new draft to all of you. So what I'm sharing here, so, so I, I kind of believe that you all saw my original minutes, you saw her proposed changes. I basically accepted it all. Um, so are there any questions or comments on the minutes or any requests to changes? If not, somebody could make a motion to approve the minutes. I will make the motion to approve the January 3rd, 2024 minutes. I don't even think I have to say is amended because these are now the minutes that I've sent out. I second that. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Roll call. Um, uh, Sarah goes first. Yes. Judy. Yes. JD. Yes. Laura. I wasn't on the board yet. So you were not. No. Not. So I will so not. You are not voting. Yeah, right. I mean, I guess technically you can abstain. You're a member now, so you can you get to abstain. Sure, I'll abstain. You should. <laughs> All right, very good. And I vote yes. So four votes for and one abstention. Minutes of January 3rd are approved. So we're going to move on to our next January 31st. This is the same deal as before. This was our joint planning board housing committee meeting. And uh, indeed, again, Laura was not a planning board member. Um, looks like there was a Judy. I sent out minutes. Judy made a change. Ah. So this is a question for you, Judy. So I had trouble, Judy suggested under documents reviewed on file of the planning board that we need to put a date. So sort of a lesson learned, like, Judy, do you know the date? There's so many different revisions of the community housing bylaw that went around. Do you have a date? Well, I suggested we using the the date of the email prior, immediately prior to this meeting. You mean that, well, I know, but I had trouble figuring out what email and I couldn't find an email you sent out immediately prior to Jan. So I was really asking you to just find that and give me a date if we want to table this for now and come back to it. But okay. I, um, I don't know what the, the date is, and when you were sending drafts of your bylaw yeah. around, the drafts themselves did not have dates within them. Yep. All right, so we will table this the minutes for January 31st, pending a date from Judy for that particular meeting draft. We're going to move on to February 28th. Laura Ross, first time on the board. All right. All right. Again, went through 
initial duties revisions by accepting those revisions and circulating a new draft. I don't think there was anything left. So unless there either comments, questions, proposed revisions to the minutes of February 28th meeting. Sarah was there. We could hear a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of February 28th. Okay, motion has been made. Second. 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 Uh, I'll give that to Laura. Motion made and seconded by Laura. Made by JD, seconded by Laura. Roll call JD. Yes. Laura. Yes. Grant. Yes. Judy. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Okay. Minutes of February 28th are approved. Moving on to um, March 27th. Here, we did get a new, thanks to Mary, we have one more change. Again, what Mary did, because this meeting was inadvertently not recorded, <laughs> um, Mary thankfully recorded the key um, times when things happened. So basically, we're going to say that public hearing opened up at 5.02 p.m., which is the same time as the meeting was called to order. Mary noted that we closed that public hearing at 5.28. Thank you. And then we did the next public hearing at 5.50 p.m., closed it at 6.27 p.m., and adjourned the meeting at 7.16 p.m. What became of item 7, the uh, 105 Christian Way? I'm sorry, the what? 105 Christian Way, what became of that? Item 7. The additional name. items not Attorney Margot Welch plan one of five Christian Way. What do I have to that? Oh. Um, so this is not related to, so it may be that I, did I not circulate that letter? I don't know. So. It doesn't, doesn't lie. it doesn't <laughs> relate to whether we can approve the minutes or not. It could just mean that you have a really crappy chair who didn't yeah. do what he said he was going to yeah. do at this meeting. Um, but, um, there's been no Basically, follow she was, she was asking for a zoning interpretation. Okay. And I think it should Brett prob probably referred her to either the building inspector or the ZBA or both. I think that was the case. Should still circulate that, but okay. the minutes are accurate in, in, in that respect. And I did what Judy suggested. I've been trying to make these minutes a little bit more a little bit more self-standing. So I've included as appendices the bylaw revisions that were discussed versus embedding them in a text. So unless there are other comments or suggestions, so now we could have a motion uh, to approve these minutes as amended. I make a motion to approve the minutes from March 27th as amended. Motion's been made. A seconded by JD. Uh, roll call vote. I'll go to the go to the callers. Uh, Sarah. Oh no, Sarah was not there. Sarah I will asked. abstain. Yes. Yeah, I guess you might vote well abstain. Um, uh, Laura, I'm not Judy. Laura. Not Laura. Judy. 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 Yes. Uh, JD. Yes. Laura. Yes. Grant. Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved with one abstention for May, March 27th. And that, except for uh, the, what we've tabled from the February 28th meeting, gets us all caught up because we don't have meeting minutes for tonight. Okay. So now we're into the um, additional items not anticipated. A joyous time in our meeting. Stop sharing. Um, so Judy has 
reminded me that she, her term on the planning board is up on June 30th. And it, I understand, Judy, your intent is not to go for another round of this. Correct. Has, just out of curiosity, have you shared that with the town moderator? Yes. Okay, so, so we'll start thinking about a replacement. Now, Judy sits on two, there are a number of situations where other committees ask for representatives from the planning board to be at the desert. So for example, I do I sit on the Franklin Regional Planning Board as the representative of the Wheatley Planning Board. I sit, that's an exterior committee. I sit on the Capital Improvement Planning Committee as the planning board representative. Judy sits on the CPC, uh, that's what the Community Judy. Preservation Committee. Yep. And you, and you also sit on the, the exit, exit 35. 35. Okay. So the the question will be upon Judy's departure, will anyone of one of us replace her on CPC? Um, I'll take the CPC for the next year. You will after Oh good for you, Sarah. Thank you, Judy. Judy. <laughs> could you just say a little bit? I'm curious myself what the CPC committee does and kind of how often they meet and that sort of thing. Could you give me a thumbnail, Judy? Sure. Um, the town has CPA funds. Um, they're generated with a surcharge on our property tax and a match from the state. And the CPC basically uh, administers the fund application, the applications for requests for use of these funds. It can be used for open space and recreation, historic preservation and affordable housing. And every year, 10% of revenues has to go to each of these, those three column buckets. Uh, there's about I think roughly $200,000 a year that comes in now. And this, the committee has a representative from the planning board, the housing committee, the historical commission, the conservation commission, and two at-large positions. One is currently held by Alan Sanderson, who's, who's their chair. And the other is by tradition an ag commission member. The bylaw is written by the state doesn't have a requirement for an ag commission, but in Waitley, it's important that they do. So we meet um, around the times of approving funding. So there are two cycles a year. One starts in December for the Springtown meeting, um, there's it's like once a month through December, January, February. And then again in in summer for, for fall town meeting for what's called out of season requests, where you have to, or out of cycle requests, you have to prove that your request is urgent enough not to be able to wait until the April town meeting. So, um, and again, meet for three or four months. The other thing we do every year is approve a plan where we look at, at the town's needs in terms of conservation and housing and recreation, historical preservation, each of those areas that relevant committees set their goals and priorities for the way the funding should be used. And the law requires that we do that once a year. It's a it's a good committee. Alan runs a, a very good committee. Okay. And it's kind of fun to give out money to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So is, this is 
So Sarah's Bell nominated. I think, do we, is this something we vote on? Or just, we just, what's been the practice in the past about this, Judy? Well, there hasn't been a whole lot of competition, but I don't know. It's been 15 <laughs> years. Um, well, why don't I we would just... assume I would assume that you vote and then you you um, send the nomination to the to the select board when the time comes. Yeah. Okay. So right now we'll take no action on this, but it's great to know that we that Sarah's. Um, well, you could take action now if you wanted, but um, if you want, that's up. It's yeah. And regarding the you share, why don't you share with the full board what you shared with me, Judy, regarding the exit thirty five study committee? Well, this is this is not a permanent committee. This is a study group that's looking to try to come up with measures to revitalize the area up around 116 and I-95. And the group is, I would say, I think about halfway through the exercise. Um, it's it's the, the slowest moving committee I've ever seen. But um, since, since we're halfway through and since it's not going on forever, I'm I'm willing to stay on if if people would like that rather than have somebody try and get caught up to speed. But that, that's up to you guys. If you if you would like to have somebody else on, that's fine too. I think continuity would be ideal as long as there's no reason why after June 30 and you're no longer a planning board member, you would no longer be eligible to serve in that role. But I. I don't, like think, I don't think anybody's going to raise the issue, to tell you the truth. Um, as another item that's out there, so that's, that's I think, where we are on those two topics. I'll put out there that um, I'm, I would be happy if somebody were interested in taking my position on capital improvement planning. And I'll say a little bit about it. Don't need... I'm happy to stay on it because, as I'm about to say, it's a very, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not very demanding as actually quite interesting. It meets for a very, just a few meetings in the run up to, um, like in the budget season. And it is an advisory committee where various capital improvement requests, funding requests from various departments in the town. They're asking for different amounts of money to do different things. The Capital Improvement Planning Committee does not choose which ones to fund. All the Capital Improvement Planning Committee does is review them and bucket them into, like, we really need this, like, really do this, or, like, do it if you can, or maybe only if you've got a lot of extra money sitting there, right? Like these three buckets. I'm on the finance committee, so I don't know if I can Yeah, you may not be able to do that. Um, I'm sort of like, again, if you want, it, I find it gives me an interesting visibility into the town. Like what's money being spent on? We learn all about like what the fire department is doing with their upgrades, firefighting equipment, and, and, and basically it's like two or three meetings. Maybe you get to actually look at some stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would say the total number of hours of commitment is a handful of hours in a given calendar year. So it's it's got the advantage of being both interesting and um, you know not a, a particularly heavy lift. I would do it if it's a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask. We're going to kind of come back to it because okay. now it's like the action is. The pressure is packed. I did my part for the run up to this annual town meeting. Didn't, didn't, um, so, didn't Judy have someone in mind as a replacement? Oh, for herself on the planning board. Yeah. Planning board? yeah. yeah. Well, do you want to speak to that again, Judy, or do you don't want to name names? Well, I had talked to Mary Stewart, who 
I think was kind of half interested. And I've subsequently wondered whether Harlan Bean might be interested. He seems to have a good feel for the zoning laws. Um, but I haven't talked to um, Mary Stewart lives in town. She she was much involved with the water with the water merger. Um, she's very good with people. Um, Nicholas thinks she would be good. She told me that her her strength is his broad view on things and and less so on details. But I think the details that wouldn't hurt to have somebody with broad perspective on the committee. So I haven't talked to her recently. I'm it is dependent on her retirement and I'm not sure that that, that comes it's sometime soon, but I don't think it's by June 30th. So I'll try and talk to her again. The diversity of viewpoints and opinions and perspective brings yeah. the strength to any board. Yeah, and that's and also distribution around like that's a, that's a solid thing. Yeah. So. How how is her last name spelled? Yeah. I think it's S T U A R T. Yeah. S T E W A R T. And was there a second name? I I, I wouldn't swear to that, but I think okay. that's it. And there's a second name. Well, I threw out Harlan Bean just because oh, I was Harlan. really, really impressed at, at at the way he seems to understand the bylaws. I think he's done enough. I agree. Over time. There are some people. There aren't people who come to things with that kind of understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good leads. So you have the action to follow up with Mary when it's convenient with all yeah, and Sarah Sarah knows Harlan, I think. I do. And maybe once once I can drive again, maybe I'll go visit or give him a call. <laughs> I can certainly talk to him. Yeah. 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 yeah some, some feelers does seem like good candidates. He okay. he has given a lot to the of his time to the town in the past. And that yeah, he's the grandfather now. He must be. <laughs> okay. Um, other things that were on my list before we wind got down for the night. Um, and I again, I I want to socialize this versus making a decision about it. That is, it turns out that for special permits, of which we don't get many. We learned that the paperwork process requires that the planning board's clerk sign off on the record of proceedings. I'm going to circulate to all of you the electronic copies of all the paperwork we've just completed for the beans for their two special permits. There's a notice of decision, and then there's a detailed record of proceedings. And the record of proceedings requires a clerk who's not the paid staff clerk, mm -hmm. Mary. And the planning board never really officially had a clerk. Judy stood in for that role. It's really somebody to provide another set of eyes, I'm told, to review the paperwork for completeness and accuracy. Um, so, I'm still trying to learn a little bit more about required roles and responsibilities. We don't have we have a chairperson. We don't have a vice chair. Mm -hmm. We probably should. We don't have a clerk. Um, I'm I've been looking at the ZBA's rules and regs, and they describe some of their positions and authorities and responsibilities. So I'm this is a little a little premature. So since I'm new to this, do we elect a chairperson every year? We should, I believe. You do a fantastic job. I haven't been even, but I would like to establish that principle that we have an annual, like on a, every September, say, we 
elect our officers, whomever they may be. But we have no written rules or regs for the planning board. Housing market was written by the housing market. It's, just, it's always been folklore. Okay. And so I've been thinking about how some of this might be codified. Uh, I don't think we need a clerk right away, <laughs> unless next month we get more applications. I hope we get this new form up before we get any more applications for special permits, because I don't want to spend <laughs> more town money for advertising. So I, again, I just want to socialize. I think it would be healthy for this board to have some kind of document that lays out who are what the roles and responsibilities are of the chair, the vice chair, the clerk, and the staff secretary, at least. And there's some stuff that I can draw on, and I've been starting to draft something, but I, I don't have anything yet. Um, before we adjourn, are we signing Marilars tonight? And yes, we're going to sign. We have three of us is enough to do the Marilars for the AR. And I have the stamp ready to go, and the so I want to do this. So, so Judy and kind of, Sarah don't need to come. So. Judy and Sarah do not need to come to sign okay. my Lara. Okay. Three's, three's a crowd. Um, so with that, I don't think I have any more items not anticipated. Does anyone else have anything else they need or want to bring up to me? Um, regarding uh, for to, to Sarah and Judy, I'd like to just take the award topic offline because I don't think we, I think we can just okay, do this. Fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, oh, well, I mean, I, again, I should acknowledge, we I've sent around that Mary is retiring, step, she's resigning from the board at the end of May. Um, so I'm working with her to get minutes and help her clean up that. We're getting ready to post um, a, an advertisement to replace Mary on the planning board. So, um, I mean, Jessica said she has too much of a plate. Yeah, Jessica is not going to be able to take that take that on. So we're going to do a, a just a regular job posting. And once that is up, I'm going to ask everybody to circulate it to their social networks, and we'll and we can talk about it. Um, but that's going to be coming up soon. Okay. I mean, and, and I think at our next meeting in May, which will be around the time where Mary is winding up, uh, we'll want to have a discussion about where we stand at that point and we don't have a smooth replacement. How will, like I've been, you've noticed I've been sort of filling in for minutes. Um, but we will probably have another discussion in the May. The historical commission rotates among members, exclude except for the chair. So, but I do want to take this moment to a publicly thank Mary for. I mean, I don't know how many years of service to the planning board, and give you the floor to just like say anything that you feel like saying, all I know is that you've been a fixture for far longer than I've been on the board and served for it's, in. It's been 15 years. <clears throat> and uh, one thing I would like to note is that from time to time when I used to read things in the paper, I'd see that things get contentious in some towns over you know what should happen or what shouldn't happen sometimes it looks like people may have their own agendas and i've never noticed that in waitley and that that was really very nice <laughs> i felt kind of bad for some of the other places where they're kind of scrappy but <laughs> it seemed to me that, like the people that i've worked with have always been uh, on a pretty good straight through line for doing what they think is best for the town, whether they had different opinions about what that is or not, it always seemed to be for the right reason. And uh, uh, 
I know some of some of you are I'm I'm quite new to. <laughs> I'm still having trouble picking out your faces on these hybrid meetings because I <laughs> the faces shrink down to about a quarter of an inch on my screen and the light in the box goes with it. So I can't it, and that's just for the people sitting up front. The people in the audience <laughs> they're distant. <laughs> And the light fades too. So that's really something that's kind of hard to deal with going forward on that. But um, Sarah and Judy, I've been with the longest. And I've and really just put up with us for a long time. Too, you, you've, you've, been, you've all been so supportive. <laughs> it's really been, uh, you know, I mean, there's, the job has become something that doesn't fit with my life anymore but it, it had its good moments too you know in, in years past and everybody was so good about you know working with them and and as I said being supportive it's I'm, I'm grateful for that uh, it was nice working with smart people who knew what they were doing and <laughs> seemed to get things done <laughs> And that's about it. it I'll I'll have uh, good memories of all of that and of both of you. <laughs> we couldn't have done it without you, Mary. <laughs> that's true. Thank you. Well, so we'll see you again, Mary, on our next regularly scheduled meeting at the May, whatever that date is. Um, yeah, Wednesday of May, yeah. May 24th. Do we need to discuss... Uh, it looks like May 29th is the last Wednesday of May. Okay. I'll have our last next planning board I meeting. Won't, I, won't be if, I won't be available. Okay, you won't be available. Um, what do we need? Do we need to talk about, now that we've done all of our bylaw revisions for this annual town meeting, what do we have to do next? And... We're on a bit of a tight timeline to get our piece of the work done. Judy, I think all you have to do is all you have to do is send it. To, uh, I don't know whether you send it. I think you send it to the town administrator. So I understand we need to write a report that provides oh. our recommendations. I think you just say that we we have approved. We basically send them with our approval. So perhaps what you and I are going to do outside of this meeting, and then well, I'll figure out operationally how to do this without running foul of open meeting law. But um, we'll have what to work. What did you do last? Out. I mean, what did you do last year? What did I do last year? I didn't do anything last year. I wasn't involved. I, I believe it was you, Judy. <laughs> I, I, I just sent them to Brian. Huh. I sent the wording huh. to Brian. Well, I will investigate and see if it's more than just we send the war and army. And stuff. That would be wonderful if it proves to be true. I spoke a little bit briefly earlier tonight with Lynn, and she said something about a report that explains things in a form that would be helpful to um, sure. residents right. of town meeting. Okay, so that's just the little paragraph for each okay. that, that goes in that um, supplement that he has. Yeah. And he did that, but I assume that they would much prefer that we do it, so... I can I can try and draft that. Make, give me a list of that. <laughs> yeah. let, 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 let me hold the ball first, put some initial skeleton of a document together, and then you and I will collaborate on it. Is that okay, Judy? Sure. Okay. All right. Very good. Awesome. I think that's everything we need to do tonight. Um, that's right. What was that? That's right. Yes, almost. So, well, that's enough time for signing. Okay. So, unless there's anything else, crazy. Motion to you, adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Grant. Was that? Yes. 
<laughs> I, I'm just wanting to check off things here. Um, I came in, you know, at like uh, four minutes after the hearings started for the zoning changes. Did you use the preceding 15 minutes to cover the Moraski parcel and the- We did. We did uh, all of that in front. Okay. And I, I mean- Did, did that pass? Have... Yes. The yes. ANR yeah. passed unanimously. That's right. Now, and I'm still, maybe you and I, Mary, will talk because I want to get a sense of where you are with the ZBA and so forth. Whether you want to do minutes for tonight or, or have me do minutes for tonight, as usual, this meeting's been not only, uh, well, we've recorded it and we're generating a transcript, which will help make the minutes easier to, to prepare. But you and I, Mary, will talk by email about if you want to do minutes for tonight or not. Okay. We have a motion to adjourn from JD. Second. Second from Laura. And I, I always believe you don't need to vote on that. Okay. <laughs> So the meeting is adjourned at 6 p.m.